Hello, my name is Kirk Geyer, and I'm the General Manager of Biomedica Diagnostics. On behalf of the Biomedica team, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our series of scientific discussions with key opinion leaders in the field of thrombosis and hemostasis. I hope that you will find these topics both informative and stimulating. At the end of each video, you will find an email address where you may send us your comments and opinions. We would also appreciate your suggestions for future topics that may interest you. Now, on behalf of Biomedica, please enjoy. Hello and welcome to Coe Conversations, our guest is Professor Emmanuel Favaloro. Professor Favaloro is a principal hospital scientist at the Institute of Clinical Pathology and Medical Research, Westmead Hospital, and is a founding member of the Sydney Centers for Thrombosis and Hemostasis. He's affiliated with both Sydney and Charles Sturt Universities and is the current editor-in-chief of Seminars in Thrombosis and Hemostasis. The title of Professor Favaloro's series is The Many Faces of Von Willebrand Factor or Von Willebrand Factor, Adam TS-13, Malignancy and Beyond. We start with conversation number one, which is entitled Von Willebrand Factor and Acquired Von Willebrand Syndrome a kaleidoscope of presentations. Let's begin. Dr. Favaloro, please give us an overview of von Willebrand factor, its function, and its relationship to von Willebrand disease and to acquired von Willebrand syndrome. Well, thank you, first of all, George, uh, and uh, Biomedica Diagnostics for having me in these cohort conversations. Uh, I'm happy to introduce the major topic of these conversations being the plasma protein we call von Willebrand factor. So this is a pro-hemostatic protein and it has many functions, but ultimately what it does is it promotes platelet adhesion to sites of vascular damage. So von Willebrand factor actually has many adhesive sites. And one of the adhesive sites is to bind to platelets via the von Willebrand factor glycoprotein 1B, which is a VWF receptor. Uh, and also to collagen, and collagen is a matrix protein which exists uh, be, below the uh, sub -end, it's a subendothelial matrix protein, so it exists below the endothelium. Uh, so when the endothelium is damaged, the von Willebrand factor can bind to this collagen and can also bind to the platelets, and in this way, it anchors platelets to the sites of vascular injury. And in my teachings, I like to, to talk about von Willebrand factor as a kind of sticky string or a kind of mortar that um, that helps bind the platelets uh, or the bricks, if you like, uh, together to make the thrombus war and to stop the loss of blood uh, following an injury. Now, of course, platelets aren't inert like bricks uh, and uh, von Willebrand factor is not inert like mortar, but you can consider it as kind of a, a, a way of building up a platelet thrombus. So von Willebrand factor binds to the platelets, binds to the, uh, to the collagen and immobilizes and builds up a platelet thrombus uh, at the site of injury. And in this way, you have you prevent the loss of blood. Um, so, of course, there are many other hemostasis proteins that are involved in this process, but the uh, platelet brick wall, if you like, would indeed be weak without the presence of von Willebrand factor. It's also important to note that von Willebrand factor exists in various multimeric forms, in other words, increasing size. So you have small multimers of von Willebrand factor uh, to intermediate forms of von Willebrand factor, up to high molecular weight von Willebrand factor. And the larger the multimer or the larger the von Willebrand factor, then the more adhesive or more functional that sticky string is uh, in terms of its ability to bind to platelets and to anchor those platelets to the sites of injury. So knowing that von Willebrand factor is a pro-hemostatic uh, protein involved in formation of thrombus, 
uh, you can appreciate that the lack of vomitoban factor or dysfunctional forms of vomitoban factor will lead to conditions of bleeding uh, and in congenital forms, we call these uh, vomitoban disease. If we talk about acquired forms of deficiency or defect in vomitoban factor, we call that acquired vomitoban syndrome, both reflecting an increased potential for bleeding loss due to the loss of that sticky string. Well, thank you for that overview, Dr. Favaloro. That's very, very helpful. You know, we've heard rather little about acquired von Willebrand syndrome. Isn't this a rare finding? Is it important for us to consider? No, absolutely. So um, most of the work that we do is in congenital von Willebrand disease, but acquired von Willebrand disease is uh, greatly underdiagnosed or underrecognized. Uh, historically, acquired vomitoban syndrome was mainly associated to various malignancies, uh, typically blood malignancies or, 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 or blood uh, uh, leukemias and uh, other uh, types of malignancies. And what happens in these malignancies is that uh, vomitoban factor may absorb onto the cancer cells uh, or there may be development of antibodies against vomitoban factor that then either causes fast clearance of vomitoban factor from the plasma, so the disappearance of vomitoban factor from the plasma, or the antibodies may inhibit vomitoban factor function. And interestingly, different antibodies will inhibit different functions of vomitoban factor. Uh, and loss of vomitoban factor uh, in general uh, will lead to what we call a type 1 disorder. And this is true of both congenital and acquired vomitoban syndrome. So, uh, acquired, uh, so a type 1 disorder is simply where you have a loss of von Willebrand factor in quantity. So it's a quantitative disorder. Uh, or there may be a preferential loss of the largest high molecular weight forms, um, which I indicated were the most functional or adhesive forms, and that leads to a type 2 disorder. And that occurs, as I said, both in congenital and in acquired von Willebrand syndrome. Well, uh, what are some of the malignancies that are associated with acquired von Willebrand syndrome? Are they mostly hematologic? Um, as I said, historically, we considered mostly the hematological um, disorders as acquired von Willebrand syndrome. But if you don't mind, I'm just going to share a slide with you. Slide. This is a summary of some of the conditions that may lead to an acquired von Willebrand syndrome. Uh, I'm not saying that this is an exhaustive slide and, and will identify all forms of acquired von Willebrand syndrome. But as I said, most of the historical look back, if you like, in terms of acquired von Willebrand syndrome was in terms of the myeloproliferative or the blood cancers, if you like, the myeloproliferative neoplasms, the multiple myeloma and lymphoma being among the most common forms. And in these forms of von, acquired von Willebrand syndrome, what it happens is you get an absorption of the von Willebrand factor to the surface of the transformed cancer cells or to the platelets, and or you may have an anti-autobody mediated clearance of von Willebrand factor or an antibody-associated interference in VWF activity. So all those mechanisms are possible depending on the neoplasm. But also there are uh, solid cancers uh, such as Wilms tumor, bladder adenocarcinoma, lung adenocarcinoma, prostate cancer, as some examples, where some of the same mechanisms can occur. In other words, absorption of von Willebrand factor onto the cancer cells, but there are also other mechanisms uh, which are not very well worked out. But increasingly these days, and I'll talk more about this in a little while, but these days we actually uh, are beginning to recognise an increased incidence, if you like, of acquired von Willebrand syndrome in a host of cardiac or cardiac support situations. So some of the examples I've listed here, aortic stenosis, paravalvular leak, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease, uh, but increasingly now left reticular assist devices and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation devices, so ECMO type devices. And what happens here is you can get absorption of von Willebrand factor onto the artificial surfaces, or you can get mechanical destruction of the von Willebrand factor under high shear stress and increased proteolysis of that von Willebrand factor by Adams TS13. Now, I haven't talked about Adams TS13 yet. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about Adams TS13 a little while as well. But those conditions that associate that association with acquired von Willebrand syndrome in those cardiac uh, situations or in ECMO uh, increasingly being recognised, but also can be aggravated potentially by a reduction in platelet activity as well. So platelets also adhere to the plastic surfaces and activate 
And then you might get a hypoplatelet activity as well as a hypo-VWF activity and expanding out the bleeding risk in some of those patients. And as I indicated, the increased bleeding risk can be due to either a loss of vomitant brain factor like a type 1 disorder or a loss of high molecular weight VWF being a type 2 disorder. Very good. This is very helpful. I didn't know that there were risks of this sort associated with ECMO or with LVAD or aortic stenosis. That's very interesting. Uh, I'm curious about how these are reflected in the various assays. Could you go through in, in a little bit of detail what are the various assays that we use and how they would turn out in um, acquired von Willebrand syndrome? So indeed, and uh, this actually brings me to one of my more favorite uh, topics of uh, uh, von Willebrand factor and von Willebrand disease, and that's in terms of the assay uh, methods that we use uh, for identifying von Willebrand disease. So again, I'm going to bring up another slide now. So there are a large number of assays that uh, we can use to look at von Willebrand factor level and function, and some of these are listed here. These are the most common forms of assays that we use. Now, not all laboratories perform all these assays, and that's potentially a problem in terms of the ability of certain laboratories to identify vomitant brain disease and indeed uh, acquired vomitant brain syndrome. And this is probably one of the reasons that acquired vomitant brain syndrome is under-recognized. So the assays include vomitant brain factor antigen, which measures the level of vomitant brain factor. The assay measures both functional and non-functional forms of vomitant brain factor. So it's not an activity assay, it's just a, a quantitative assay that gives you an, an idea of the level of vomitant brain factor. And if the level of vomitant brain factor is low, then you have an increased risk for bleeding. Then the next major group of assays are the glycoprotein 1B binding assays. So these are assays that interrogate the ability of vomitant brain factor to bind to glycoprotein 1B. Now, remember I mentioned that glycoprotein 1B is a VWF receptor on platelets. Now, there are three main ways of doing this assay. One is the classical risocetin cofactor assay, which is the original glycoprotein 1B binding assay. And that's still used by quite a large number of laboratories. But increasingly now, laboratories are turning to more modern alternatives for the glycoprotein 1B binding assays, which include the glycoprotein 1B R assay. The R stands for recombinant glycoprotein 1B or glycoprotein 1B M assays. And the M stands for mutated glycoprotein 1B. So these assays are newer assays, but essentially all three of those assays uh, interrogate the binding of vomitant brain factor to glycoprotein 1B, and they're largely interchangeable. Now, in the US, there has been essentially a restriction of the available assays that have been regularly cleared to the risocetin cofactor and another assay, which I don't mention because I don't actually consider it an activity assay. But recently, the FDA is now cleared the glycoprotein 1B M assay. But you can still use the other assays uh, as, long, you know, as long as you recognize that they're not FDA cleared. And certainly in other geographic geographies like Australia, for example, we have access to all of them. And also Europe has access to all these assays. Now, another assay that's not very often used is the collagen binding assay. This interrogates the collagen binding activity of vomitant brain factor. And remember, I mentioned that vulnerable brain factor anchors platelets to the damaged endothelium via the subendothelial matrix components such as collagen. So it's an important in vivo mechanism and it's also an important in vitro assay. And the assays that we run can be made sensitive to vulnerable brain factor affecting collagen binding and also sensitive to the high molecular weight VWF. And similarly, the glycoprotein one b assays can be made sensitive to mutations in uh, vomitant brain factor affecting uh, glycoprotein 1B binding and also sensitive to high molecular weight VW. But they're different assays and they're complementary. The other main utility really is looking at the assay ratio. So uh, looking at the glycoprotein 1B binding to antigen ratios, and it doesn't matter again which of those you use, just the ratio of the glycoprotein 1B binding activity assay to antigen or the collagen binding to antigen. And these provide you a, a measure of the specific VWF activity to antigen, which is low in type 2 disease, reflective of high molecular weight VWF loss. Now, this is important in congenital vomitant brain disease. It's important in acquired vomitant brain syndrome, but it's becoming increasingly important in acquired vomitant brain syndromes that are associated with loss of high molecular weight VWF. 
particularly the uh, conditions that I mentioned in terms of left ventricular uh, assist devices and in terms of ECMO. And then you can also perform multiple analysis, uh, which is, uh, assesses the structural integrity of von Willebrand factor and also gives you a clue as to whether there's a loss of high molecular weight BWF in type 2 disease. Thank you. This is a wonderful review of the various assays, which um, I think confused an awful lot of us in the clinical setting. But to go on, so the acquired von Willebrand syndrome, aren't the symptoms just about the same as those of congenital von Willebrand disease? Yes. In general, um, the risk uh, for patients with uh, acquired von Willebrand syndrome and also the risk associated with um, congenital von Willebrand disease is really one primarily of bleeding risk. Uh, so in general, that's true. But in some conditions, uh, it's, it's more complicated than that. And I just raised the condition, as I mentioned, in regards to ECMO, uh, where there can be complications of bleeding, but also there can be complications of thrombosis or clot formation in the circuit uh, and intravascular hemolysis. And patients in ECMO are actually often put on anticoagulant therapy to prevent thrombosis or clot formation. And so management in ECHO reflects a balance uh, of trying to manage hemostasis uh, and prevent thrombosis, clot formation, and also to prevent bleeding. Um, and ECMO is actually, as I said, it's, it's an increasingly uh, applied technology. And a recent ECMO review that we published now in STH highlighted an example from Germany where the annual number of VA or uh, venous arterial ECMO procedures increased from 80 in 2007 to 2,614 in 2015. And that's an increase of more than 30-fold. And just to remind the uh, audience, there are three types of ECMO. The venous venous, veno venous ECMO, uh, veno arterial ECMO and central ECMO. And the venous venous, venous venous ECMO or VV ECMO is indicated to support the lung, that is for respiratory failure. The VA ECMO and central ECMO are used to support both the lung and the heart. And it's not uncommon for patients with a severe COVID-19, for example, to be put on ECMO support for more than one year until recovery or lung transplant. And as another example uh, for left particular assist devices, uh, one of the uh, continuous flow devices called HeartMate 2, which is currently the device approved by the uh, FDA for both bridge to transplant and destination therapy, has now been implanted in more than 15,000 patients worldwide as of 2016. It's probably much higher than now in 2023. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, that concludes our first conversation. Favaloro, thank you for your expertise. We encourage participant questions and comments, and there's a link on the Biomedica Diagnostics website for you to forward your questions or comments. Please join us next month for conversation number two, entitled Von Willebrand Factor and Adam TS13, Tumor Progression and Beyond. Thanks to Biomedica Diagnostics for sponsoring COEG Conversations, and thank you for participating.